Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door, and I'm just outside my door. I'm here with a couple of the monarch rearing containers that I showed you how to do in some of my previous episodes. This, I think, is now the fifth or sixth episode that I have in my series on monarchs. I started with finding milkweed, and then we went to finding eggs on milkweed, and then we went to rearing caterpillars, and then I did two series on how to make bug boxes like this that are really well ventilated and perfect for keeping monarch leaves, and like this one right here, which I call my five-star monarch rearing container. And here, of course, is a monarch caterpillar, one of several that I've been rearing here. Today, we're gonna to talk about monarch instars, and if we're talking about monarch instars, we have to talk about how caterpillars molt, what is molting, and what is an exoskeleton. So we're gonna cover all those things, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some monarch diseases and what you might need to be aware of with your caterpillars. So stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're gonna find. And there's a make this invasive. There's a dog. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes in terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's... So before I talk about the monarchs, let's do a quick review. Monarch butterflies are insects. Insects are characterized by having six legs, three body parts, a head, thorax, and abdomen. The legs are attached to the thorax and they have six legs and two pairs of wings. Now, you might say, well, but a monarch caterpillar, it doesn't have all those things. So that's correct. Those parts are there, but they're not really defined like we do. And they have extra legs that we call prolegs. So the monarch caterpillar actually has 10 extra legs, a set of four pairs of prolegs kind of in the middle, of his abdomen and two prolegs on the back, which kind of work like suction cups to help them move. And then the mature caterpillars have six legs at the front of their body, so it's pretty complicated. So all insects go through growth and development. Some insects go through a process called complete metamorphosis, and some insects go through a process called incomplete metamorphosis. Organisms that go through complete metamorphosis are like butterflies, beetles, and houseflies, for example. Organisms that go through incomplete metamorphosis would include praying mantises, dragonflies, and damselflies, for example. So in order to grow, these organisms have to molt. And why is it they have to molt? Because they have an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is an external skeleton. Humans, people, dogs, cats, they have internal skeletons. I have an internal skeleton. A dog has an internal skeleton. An insect is a member of the group Arthropoda. And Arthropoda would also include the millipedes and centipedes and spiders, as well as the insects. And all of them have an external skeleton. All of them have an exoskeleton, and all of them have to molt in order to grow. So the monarch butterfly goes through complete metamorphosis, which means it goes from egg to the larva to the pupa, which in the monarchs we call a chrysalis, and to the winged adult stage that has all the features of an insect. Organisms like a dragonfly go through a series of smaller changes as they develop, and they change little by little. If you look at a dragonfly larva in a pond, you will see that it has big jaws, six legs, three body parts, and big eyes, as does the adult. And it does a final change, and it's really a special kind of incomplete metamorphosis. But we'll talk more about that later. Here's another insect that undergoes incomplete metamorphosis. These are aphids and actually on a milkweed plant. And you can see they're all different sizes. Between molts, they just get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, 
and they start to take on more adult features very, very slowly. And the adults would just look like the largest one of these, but with added wings. So incomplete metamorphosis is a gradual change. So incomplete metamorphosis is a dramatic change from this all the way to this. That's a huge change. So that's why we call it complete metamorphosis. Today, I want to get into looking at the five instars of monarch caterpillar development. The instars are stages between molts. When the monarch egg hatches, it comes out as a tiny caterpillar. And it will begin to eat. And as it eats, it'll grow. And when it can't grow any more in that exoskeleton and it stretched it all out, it'll molt and leave that skin. And molting is controlled by a hormone, an insect. So a hormone is released, which will cause that molting process. And its skin will split. It'll climb out of that skin and become a second instar larva. The second instar larva does the same thing. It eats, it grows, it stretches out its skin. And when the hormone gets active, it sheds that skin and molts again. So it'll molt five times as it goes from instar to instar to instar. And there's five instars. Let's take a look at those instars specifically right now. Talk a little bit about each group. So this is a chart that I made to show the different instars. So what is an instar? It's a stage between molts. So a first instar larva is a larva that hatched from an egg. And here I put down for each of the five instars, so they go through five molts, I wanted to show you the size range that you expect to find each in. Why is there a size range? Well, for one, there's variability in biology. So for example, if you took 10 of your friends that were all the same age, you would find that your friends have different heights. So the caterpillars are the same way. Well, not all caterpillars are exactly the same size. The second reason there's a size range is that the caterpillars will grow during the molt and they will um, uh, put on length and they'll stretch that skin and put width on and to become larger until they stretch that exoskeleton out or that skin until it can't grow anymore or can't expand anymore and they'll shed their skin and so that they can fill into the next one and get bigger and bigger. So in each instar, there's a big range. So for example, a fifth instar larva can go from 25 all the way up to 45 millimeters in length. So the life cycle begins with a female monarch laying eggs. And here's a female monarch flitting from plant to plant, laying one egg at a time. And each time she lands on that leaf, she extends her abdomen underneath the leaf and lays one egg on it. And I have yet to find more than one egg on any plant. And the monarchs do this so that there's not competition for food. It's not like laying eggs in a tree. Butterflies that lay eggs in trees tend to often lay the eggs in a large group because there's unlimited leaves in a tree. So the eggs are laid virtually one per plant on the underside of the leaf where they're protected from direct sunlight, ultraviolet rays, and they tend to be hidden somewhat from uh, predators that, that might want to eat a tasty monarch egg. You can see it's kind of shaped like a football. It has little striations on it. And if you look at this leaf picture and then look at a close-up, you can see that the egg itself is barely visible. So the first instar larva is going to be really, really small. So here is a first instar larva. And I put it up against the chart that we have. First instar larvae are between two and six millimeters long. This one is just barely a day old. Now I want to show you some video of a newly hatched first instar larva. This larva probably just hatched out of the egg literally minutes ago. And can you see what he's doing? He's eating his eggshell. So the first thing a monarch first instar caterpillar does when it's born is to stop and first eat its eggshell. There's nutrition in there. You don't want to waste it. 
It's hard for this guy to eat. He's got tiny, tiny jaws. So the first thing he'll eat is his own egg. And the second thing he'll start to eat and is the fibers on that leaf, that soft, downy underside of the leaf. He'll first eat, start eating those fibers. And then as he gets a little bit bigger, he'll start eating the soft parenchyma cells in between the veins of the leaf which are, are more nutritious and not as hard to eat as the veins. So he'll just eat tiny, tiny little pieces of leaf. And one of the things that you'll see when the first instar larva is there, you'll just see some tiny little holes in there. And as he eats, he'll start to grow and become stronger and be able to eat bigger chunks. So after the first instar larva has grown as much as he can, stretched out the skin he was born in to about six millimeters in length, he will shed and become a second instar larva. And the second instar larva, I happen not to have one in the groups right now, will grow and go to about nine millimeters. And when he can't expand anymore in the skin or exoskeleton is in, a hormone will be released. He'll molt and become a third instar larva. Now the third instar larva is still pretty small. Check out this one that, that I have. But also check out what he's doing. This one just molted. This one just molted from a second in star to become a third in star. And you can see his skin there. And more important than that, what's he doing with his skin? He's eating his skin. So just like the first in star that turned around when it was born and ate its eggs so it wouldn't lose any nutrition... This, this caterpillar is eating its shed skin. And you can tell it's a shed skin because it's all wrinkled up. You can see some of the black lines on it. Sometimes you can see the tentacles still attached to it. And it's his old skin that he shed. He molted. And now he's eating his skin so that he doesn't lose any of the nutrition that it was so hard to come by that he worked so hard to get by chewing up and eating and digesting all that milkweed so nothing is wasted. So here's what I think might be a fourth instar larva. And what I did was I cut the leaf so I could put them right up against our little measuring mark there. And you can see that He's right in that fourth instar range. So this is likely a fourth instar caterpillar. And this big old caterpillar, let's see. Well, it's not a first instar. It's not a second. It's not a third. It's not a fourth. This big old caterpillar is for sure a fifth instar larva. And I'm expecting this one to maybe... I even stop eating now and look for a place to climb up and form its J larva and hang to form a chrysalis. But we'll see. I'll put him back in one of the cages with extra milkweed and he'll have the opportunity to go on eating or hang upside down depending what he wants to do. You can see how long his front tentacles are and that's usually a characteristic of a late instar larva and those tentacles are fully developed like that. So the fifth instar caterpillar will eventually stop eating and climb to a high spot where it can form a silken pad and hang upside down in the uh, eventually in the shape of a J and form a chrysalis like this one by shedding its skin or molting one last time. In the next episode I'll talk about J larvas and forming the chrysalis. And the last thing I want to do in this episode is talk a little bit about diseases that the caterpillars can get. Unfortunately, you can try to do everything right and keep the cage clean and have it well ventilated. Sometimes caterpillars will catch a variety of diseases. And it's sad when you see one die that's in your possession. The different things they can get, they can get a viral disease called nuclear polyhedrus. They can also get a bacterial disease, which is a pseudomonas bacteria. Both of them, and the end result is the caterpillar turns black and dies. This set of diseases has been called the Black Death, even though it's a little bit of a misnomer. 
because it's caused by two very, very different things. Viruses, bacteria, they can also get a protozoan. And the initials for this disease, they call it EO, and I'll put the scientific name of it up on the screen and you'll see why I didn't try to say it out loud. So that is another uh, bad situation that you can get in a colony of caterpillars. And then there are other insects which prey on them. Caterpillars are kind of an easy target for wasps and flies because caterpillar can't run, can't really hide, it's just there. And there's a variety of wasps and flies that will lay eggs on or in caterpillars and not just monarch caterpillars. So I had this particular scenario. and Let me show you what I observed and see if you can figure out, like I did, what happened. So I had a caterpillar in a container like this with milkweed leaves that well ventilated but protected from anything that could get in and of course nothing could get out. And soon after this caterpillar pupated, I noticed that the chrysalis had started to turn brown on one side. Normally the chrysalises are a very light, radiant kind of green. And I thought, uh-oh, there's something going on here. This is not good. And then the next day, I looked in the chamber and I thought, what? What is that? And so I took off the top and got these two things out. So I looked at one of these up close and suddenly I realized that it was a pupa. I had in the pan this guy hanging upside down from the top of the screen on the jar top and there were two pupa down below. So can you figure out what happened here? The story on this is that a tachinid fly laid its eggs in the caterpillar. The fly larva lived inside the caterpillar and allowed the caterpillar to continue eating and feeding and eating milkweed leaves. And meanwhile, the fly larva, as maggots, were living on the inside of this caterpillar as true parasites. The caterpillar climbed up, formed its chrysalis, and shed its larval skin. And soon after, these guys cut a hole here, the maggots climbed out and formed a pupa. Monarch butterflies go undergo complete metamorphosis. Flies also go under complete metamorphosis. The larval stage of the fly is a maggot, and for uh, this species called a tachinid fly, they lay their eggs on monarch caterpillars, and the eggs develop inside, the maggots grow inside, eat out the inside of the caterpillar, but don't hurt it enough to prevent it from forming the chrysalis. But at this point, they finish eating and then cut a hole through the side and they come out and form a pupa. So in a few days, this pupa will hatch into a tachinid fly. So that is one of the parasites that affect monarch caterpillars. So it's a tough world out there in nature. Scientists estimate that only 10% of the monarch eggs survive to adulthood. So that's what we call a 90% mortality rate. It's a tough world. There's so many different things that can happen to an egg or larva or chrysalis until it reaches the adult stage. There is so much to teach and so much to learn from following the monarch butterfly life cycle. So much to learn about monarchs and so much to learn about nature. Look up monarch caterpillars, look up butterflies, look up monarch diseases. Go ahead and research more stuff. I'm just giving you just a little bit of information about the many, many things that you can learn. And I want you to be an active learner. I don't want you to just watch my YouTube channel. I want you to look stuff up and look and see what other people are doing and see what you can find out. My next episode will be on the J larva, which is the stage where the monarch butterfly hangs upside down and forms a chrysalis. We'll talk about the chrysalises and we'll talk 
tagging monarchs. Thanks for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please subscribe and share with your friends. We'll see you soon.